actually the school was 30 years in November last year, but we decided to celebrate it over a period of one year because it's a significant one night. So Lagos Business School is today the business school of the Pan Atlantic University. But before then, we started, Pan Atlantic University did not start 30 years ago. So it's a situation where a child gave birth to the mother. So that's to, to put it in the, in the Nigerian way. Well, it started off in 1991, aimed at seeing how can we help in uplifting the quality, the standard of management in Nigeria. Most importantly, responsible management. Of course, you know what, is, what our country is all about. And at that time, many organizations used to send their top management team to to schools abroad to enhance their own quality and to acquire the skills necessary to run businesses successfully in Nigeria. So when it started, it was not a university and started with a program called the Chief Executive Program. Say like, like building a house from the top. Most people like to build a foundation. So, so if you can start influencing the chief executives, it will be possible to drive that kind of culture in most organizations. And if the chief executives are happy with what they see, the chances are that they're not going to send their own subordinates to attend programs school. So we started with that. Then several uh, function-specific programs were introduced, like total quality management. But at some stage, we felt that an MBA program should be introduced. And since we are not a university, we decided to partner with uh, our sister school, uh, ESA Business School in Barcelona, which is one of the top three business schools in the world. They actually midwifed us and helped us in starting an MBA program. So as our executive MBA program, and the participants actually were awarded the ESA uh, degree since we are not a university but by 20 by 2002 we now got a university license called Pan Africa University but now you hear it's Pan Atlantic because at some stage the bigger boys uh, African Union decided to set up a Pan African University so we had to although we're the first to register but we had to yield defer to them and change our name to Pan Atlantic University. But since then, the school has grown because from one executive MBA, we now offer four variants of MBA. We have executive MBA, modular executive MBA, a full-time MBA, which is the MBA, and then a modular MBA. And you may ask why, it's still the same MBA but targeted at different people in terms of who they are, the kind of convenience they want, and when they can come in and do the program. Why do they choose to go abroad? They wanted quality education. So for us to be able to attract them and keep them here, we need to offer the same quality. And how do you assess that the quality of the MBA is high? is through international accreditation. So we have two international accreditations, ACSB and AMBA, and these are the two topmost international accreditations. To show for AMBA, only about 2% of business schools in the world, and for ACSB, only about 5%. So having those accreditation is an endorsement of the quality of programs we offer. So which is critical for us? So because we offer that, we can then attract quality uh, students. But let's not kid ourselves. Look at the population of Nigeria. There is no way we can satisfy the need of all the people who want to go to school. So you still have some people going to do their, pro uh, their programs abroad. But one thing we, we, we know and we distinguish us from schools abroad 
is that we have a competitive advantage, which we don't have, and that's that we know how to do business in Africa. So, no problem. They can go to Harvard, and there's nothing wrong with it because they can network eh, with other people. But when they come back, they have to see how do they adapt what they have learned to their own environment. But for us, we are already immersed in the environment. Our faculty, made up of people who have actually worked in industry, so they have the practical experience in Nigeria, in addition to the academic background, and at the same time engage in research work to help Nigerian and African businesses and even institutions. In addition to that, they do consulting work. So you see, they bring in that expertise about doing business in Africa into the classroom. Two things that are peculiar about what we do and also set us apart is that business ethics is critical to whatever we, we teach here. For the simple reason that we want to produce responsible leaders and managers who will run businesses responsibly. What do I mean by responsible business? It is not just how much profit am I going to make? But in trying to make profit, am I conscious of the needs of the society where I operate? Am I conscious of the needs of the environment? So that's the reason why we have the Sustainability Center. So we set up a Sustainability Center to try and embed that in whatever we teach, not just our MBA students, also those who come for any executive program. Business ethics makes you responsible. So we are talking of responsibility in terms of governance, corporate governance, the way you treat your employees, the way you treat your customers, the way you treat your suppliers, the way you treat your distributors, but at the same time, I, mean, I can't be making money in an environment where 70% of the people are poor. What am I doing to help alleviate that? I can't be making profit in an environment where I am destroying the land and polluting yeah, because it affects the health of those people. So that kind of business sense is what we bring in and I think we were the first to have a professor of business ethics, even in Africa, not talking of Nigeria. The environment is also dynamic and changing. It's not static. So if you look at what we taught 10 years ago, it's a little bit different from what it is. But the framework is the same. Huh? You see, the accountants will tell you profit is revenue minus <laughs> cost. So the concepts are the same, but how you now start using and applying them to change the environment. So we upgrade our curriculum regularly. And how do we do that? We're in touch with industry. We have an advisory board made up of industry captains across different industries. They advise us and tell us on the kind of managers they need, the kind of problems businesses are facing. We also organize an annual survey of what's going on. What are the challenges that businesses are facing? On the basis of that, we update our curriculum. So what should we be teaching our people? How can they fit in into industry when they live here? The biggest problem with small businesses in Nigeria is that most of them are family businesses. They also are family businesses. So when we talk of the mortality rate being high, they don't even make it up. Five years is even long. So they don't go beyond the first generation. And succession planning is one of the big things. One is one. The second is that they have not actually developed business skills that will enable them to grow the business. They are smart. They're entrepreneurs. And because of that, we decided to say, how do we add value? How do we help them? We started an owner-manager program. That's those who own them, start own them and start it, we bring them here and help them to upgrade their skills. Teach them your finance, uh, HR, operations, marketing, strategy, even show them how they can go beyond the first generation by setting up boards. So the issue of corporate governance should, should, be, should, should matter to them. Then we also train people on entrepreneurship. About 15% of our MBA students go on to start their own businesses. But the next five years, we want to bring it up to 25%. Because the only way we can grow the economy significantly is to produce more entrepreneurs. And because we're interested in that, the Bank of Industry 
just signed an MOU with us and partnered with us to set up an entrepreneurship innovation center in the school to drive innovation. You know, many of our young people are doing extremely well in the tech area, in the entertainment area, but how can we drive that into like the agri area? Because the biggest opportunity we have today in reducing unemployment is to grow the agri sector. And because of that, we've started an agri-management program here. We're not teaching them how to uh, till the land. We're teaching them how to run it as a business. Whether you're producing cassava, or you're producing yam, or you're processing plantain, how do you do it as a business so that you can try it? So in addition to making sure that there's that uh, reduction in mortality rate, we also started a family business program here. I started by telling you that most of the small businesses in Nigeria are family businesses. So this family business program is helping families to see the need to plan for succession. So that when the founder is no more there, you have somebody to take over who's been prepared to run the business. They're not interested in moving the business to the next level. So that contribution is happening. But let me just add before I end up, we also have a sister institution called Enterprise Development Center within this premises. It was set up about 20 years ago, again, to start and address the problems of micro and small businesses. So not looking at, at LBS, we we'll are looking at medium size, size, but they are the woman who's making bole. It's a business. How can you help her to make it better? The woman making my money there is a business. How can you? And that has enabled them to actually train every year thousands of over 1,500 people go through the training program across the country. So it's not a Lagos affair. So these are the contributions we are making in driving small businesses and making them to survive and strive in Nigeria. For the manufacturing companies, it signifies you know quality of the product. Not so? Yes. For us, what is our product? Knowledge. And how we deliver the knowledge. Which is the experience participants have when they come in here. And the experience starts before they even come in. When they know about the, 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 uh, the program, how they register, they come, the knowledge, and how they apply it and also follow up. And while they are here, it's not only in the classroom. So as you enter, I'm sure you must have seen the environment, creating a conducive learning environment. And so that when they come here, the processes we put in place, from admission, training, taking care of them while they're here, even when they leave us, those are the kind of processes that we want to ensure that they have pleasant experience. So, that is our own quality. And then the content they get and how relevant it is to them when they go back to their businesses. So being able to maintain that high standard. So it's a quality, it's a, it's a measure of the quality of what we do here. Both in terms of the product and the processes. You know that when people pass through here, they are excited and they can come back and also recommend us to their friends. For us, uh, three, three areas. First, I've talked of accreditation. Hmm? which again is a measure of quality. But also ranking, when you talk of ranking, they are comparing you with your peers globally. So the first one was the uh, FT, Financial Times ranking of business schools all over the world in terms of open enrollment program. Hmm? And uh, where you, people come in to attend seminars, you also carry the seminars to their companies and do it in company for them. Those are the open enrollment we have been ranked among, since 2007 among the top 70 business schools all over the world, which is a big endorsement for us. In addition, our MBA has also been ranked by the Economics Magazine. All of us know the Economics Magazine. The CEO Magazine. And these rankings also place us with, com with our peers all over the world. So it's not a ranking of the Nigerian universities or African universities. 
So for us, it's an indication and also an endorsement on the quality of the programs we deliver here. The starting point for us is our culture. Here, this is my office. I inter we interact, it's like it's a community. First of all, we're professional. Integrity is critical to us. If we are preaching business ethics, <laughs> we must practice what we preach. And it's a community where decision making process is collegial. We have a management board. I, as a dean, cannot impose my views. That collegial approach means that nobody has monopoly of knowledge. So you pick up. We don't have barriers between faculty and students. We eat the same food with them. We eat in the same cafeteria. <laughs> we use the same toilet facilities. So because we do that, communication barrier doesn't exist. But at the same time, we ensure that the quality of the facilities we have is top notch. That when visitors come at 8 o'clock in the morning, they notice, you see, if they come back at 5 p.m., they still find it the same way as they saw it at a.m. Yeah. So these are the things that we do there. So we get the students to feel, to be in a relaxed environment and at the same time know that they can, they have access to faculty. So this and maintaining a very high standard. No compromise on that. Whatever we do, whatever is, the, is the, our facilities, our programs, our staff, always high quality. But 90% of our graduates get employed by the time they leave school. And within three months of leaving school, maximum, maximum six months, all of them get jobs. So one of the things to pride ourselves that if you come and do an MBA here, you invest, quit your job after three years, come to do an MBA here. By the time you leave, you're better off. You get a better job. Those who've done the executive MBA, they are working. So they're coming Fridays and Saturdays. By the time they graduate, they have at least 30% pay rise. In the sense that they, are now, they now move to more responsibility and higher jobs. But we don't want our MBAs to be sending CVs. We want them to collect CVs. And that's the reason why we, we, we lay emphasis on entrepreneurship. Let them create jobs. As I, I remember telling that the, way, the, the best way of growing our economy is to create more entrepreneurs. And that's how we can get these young ones fully employed. The big, if you look at the small businesses employ more people, if you look at the total number of small, the employed, is by far more than the total number of what all the big businesses employ. It's not peculiar to Nigeria. Everywhere in the world is the same. So we pride ourselves in saying that when our students graduate, they get jobs. And we expose them. And they get jobs on different parts of Africa. Africa, three of, three of our MBAs toward the end of last year got jobs. An American firm employed them from here. They've not been to America. They were interviewed online. Because they're looking for global talents. So they competed with people from other parts of the world. They did not come to them Oh, in sympathy, <laughs> they want to employ people from. They competed. And three of them got a job. So we, we say, how are we helping on employment? They were creating people who can fit into industry and perform. Call it plug and play. Secondly, we are creating people who can create jobs because they become entrepreneurs and employ people. Let's not forget that businesses operate in an environment context. The policy decisions make, not even today, that we made several years ago, have impact on the business environment. So, the effectiveness of our institutions will also help in the way businesses perform. So it's not just the education, but the education you give them also help them to navigate this difficult terrain also help them to fit in as the environment changes. 
Because if you train them on critical thinking, whether there's recession or boom, <laughs> they still have to use it. If you train them on emotional intelligence, whether they're recession or boom, they still have know how to use it and manage people. So, definitely, for economic growth, you have to invest in education. So if you look at all the countries that have grown, start from third world, let's forget about the first world countries. If you look at countries like India, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Kong, Vietnam, South Korea, now even uh, Rwanda says that. Check how much they invest in education as a percentage of their total It's enormous. And for us, with our population, it's not encouraging. We are over 10, I think in between 10 and 15 million, some people say 10, sorry, 15 million children are out of school. The highest anywhere in the world. Yeah, every year we award about four scholarships to indigenous students. But we have now set up a scholarship fund to see how we can expand that. But of course, you cannot give everybody scholarship. So we're also discussing with some financial institutions, not commercial banks, of the kind of financial instruments that we can arrange that will make it possible for the students to have a, sing a loan of single digit interest rates. That is already the making. Huh? So we're hoping that before the end of this year, we should have a clear picture of how we do. So that's part of the innovation we're talking of. How do we make it possible for more people to work? But apart from that, we are also developing programs, programs that could be delivered online. That's online time, and in which people that could deliver in form of asynchronous. Well, so that is, you can buy the tape or the video and play it and learn at your own pace. So those things that if you want to learn a particular skill or know about a particular, you can then learn. You don't have to come and spend uh, two years to do that. So that is a way of making education more accessible, but at the same time developing specific skills that will help people fit into industry business. Final thoughts is that I want to say that we have two big advantages as a country. One is our population. Population implies two things. Market size, but also labor force. That if we can invest in educating our people, you know, people who now become skilled people who actually be a big export for us. And why do I say big? And once you become a big export, they be sending money home. So diaspora remittance <laughs> will shoot up. But because we can't, we can't offer all of them those, but we can train them so they can fit other places. The second is that any country that cannot feed itself is in trouble. We have 40% more arable land than Thailand that produces this rice. <laughs> that all we do is to be serious about making agriculture more attractive to the young ones. You know, it's only the older generations <laughs> that is to at risk. If you can make it more attractive, so say as a business, then we can feed ourselves and even exports. But we need some policy guidelines to help us. Simple example we fight first. Do you know it's illegal to export yam? Yeah, maize and some other companies. Huh? Why? So, all the farmers who produce yam, you only know produce once a year during rainy season. So, if they produce large quantity, they cannot sell all wasted. But if we export, means whatever you cannot sell here, you can export. Means you can even grow, you can produce more, and you employ more people. So, it is not shortchanging us. We are actually shortchanging ourselves by banning it. Why not developing business that way? But who is going to bail the cat 
to see that it's, 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 it's in our own interest to allow develop cassava, develop yam, sell what we can sell, and export. You know, if you go to Europe today, you know the yam that is being sold, you say, from Ghana. They are not Ghanaian yams, they are from Nigeria. But that means they are now sending it unofficially. And who is losing? We are losing. So Ghana is building its own image as a strong exporter of yam, and then the yam is coming from Nigeria.